already begun. No doubt about that. But the presentation is about to begin. So if you guys can make sure you have a cocktail and then work your way forward. We got space at the front. Yes. Come on. Come so on. Get yourself if anyone who in, like, wants to sit and be comfortable. Exactly. This, this is not going to be a quiz for those sitting at the front. But we, we do like having people up here. They're seating for eight, right? They're seating yes. for eight. Exactly. Now serving eight. Are you Grab it now. And you're like, oh, yeah. you're hurt. And there are some seats over here in the corner as well. Yeah. So this, this suite is not quite as conducive to everybody having a place to sit as the one we had at BMX. But you know what? You can't complain. It's the suite, right? So. so we will say this. For those of you who don't know who we are, uh, this is Brenda Andresa and I. And this is Catherine Haskins. And we're the co founders of the Bridge Club. Uh, tonight is a special, special night. Tonight marks one year that the Bridge Club was launched at uh, BMX last year. So cheers to my partner. Uh, you have to drink when you... <laughs> you, cannot, you can't be one of those. That's one of the rules of the Bridge Club. Yeah, we don't have many rules, but that's when you do have to follow. <laughs> so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Bridge Club, this was founded for the purposes for the community of the veterinary profession to be able to connect engage, learn, and grow with one another. And we are so fortunate that after over 39 test sessions, I suppose you could call it, uh, we're kind of real. Like, it's just, this is really, really happening. We have a following of almost 2,000 people. Yeah. We now have a brand new rate of $20.19 because it's 2019. We are gathering folks from every uh, corner of this profession whether you're a practice manager, a veterinarian, a technician, someone who's in marketing and pharma, we are bringing everyone together to have an amazing conversation. But before we really get started, I do have a video I'm gonna show. Some of you have seen it. But, so uh, with us if you have. Yes, but it's Pretend a little fresh to show to you what we did this last year. So I hope it's loud enough. It's like in two minutes or less. Yeah, it's really, it's not long. That's hopefully it's loud. And of course, now watching all the work. Wow. at AVMA, and we are very excited because we both get to get on an airplane and leave today. So we love Denver, <laughs> yes, but it's time for us to, to go off and do other things. Yeah, you so. get to go home, you're lucky. I get to go home, you haven't, yeah, you yeah, haven't really That's okay, that's okay, right? It's just one of but you rarely see us in the same room together, so here we are. Who would you have lunch with? And 
it was amazing to us that it was people like tonight that we're going to be hearing from, the people in the profession that have really made a huge impact, and we are calling them icons. That does whether not, they believe it or not. Whether they believe, <laughs> believe it or not. Teachers, that makes us hope. <laughs> it's the idea that we can really learn uh, from this profession of what their experience has been, and so this is all for you all tonight. So I'm going to turn this over to my wonderful partner, and uh, let's see what we've got to say. Yeah, so this is going to be fun. This is where I get the pleasure of introducing our icons for the evening. I have to get my little note card. Sorry, it's not yet. Um, so our icons for this evening, Dr. Mike Cavanaugh, who is the CEO of the American Animal Hospital Association. Consulting and so come on up, folks. Come on up. We want them to see your faces. So Julia uh, has can, been. Can, can I just interject one second? Yes, sure. I totally believe and agree everything that's been said so far, but I would like to introduce you to the Hoda and Kathy Lee. <laughs> <laughs> should like each other. It just makes it a whole lot of fun. And that is exactly why these two individuals were chosen tonight, because I have to say, personally, you have each had an impact on me through our various um, engagements in our careers, and some of them a little bit longer than others, but, and you probably didn't know this, but literally I would walk away from conversations with both these two individuals more like, oh wow, that was really smart. I'm going to have to remember that. <laughs> and I always knew if I had a question or needed advice, I could always call one or both of them, and I would get some really good, really good advice. So that's what the icon is all about. It's people that we wish we had as our friends, that we could pick up the phone and call and say, could you help me here? I have a question. You know, I want your insight on something. So so Julia has been in the industry for about 30 years. I know I don't want to put a number on it, but okay. That's it. <laughs> Couple years, right? And her, her experience has ranged from big pharma, working at Pfizer, for example, um, to entrepreneurial pharma, launching um, Summit Labs, and Aratana, and now with Aviary Consulting. So her pathway has been a very interesting one, but she's become really a mentor to a lot of people in the profession. Mike's career also has involved um, some time at Pfizer, Hills, Pesca, um, interesting working practice. Westridge Animal Hospital. Animal Hospital, exactly. <laughs> how dare I forget that. Um, and now, of course, a CEO of the American Animal Hospital Association. So kind of a 360-degree um, perspective of veterinary medicine from your, your side of things, and you, entrepreneurial, and big pharma. So, really interesting perspective, so I'm going to ask each of them a few questions here, and they're going to give you some answers, and hopefully they'll give you some insight into the kind of people they are, right? Because you can all look up on LinkedIn what their bios are. What we want to know is who you are as people. So, yes, I yes. And so, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to start this evening with a toast, and Dr. Kavanaugh, has a really good one apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so good I had to write it down. So Mark is going to get this out of the toast. Okay. <laughs> of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, <laughs> thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly complaining, wow, what a ride. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually Hunter S. Thompson. I thought that any guy that can have his remains shot out of a cannon and ass that is worth quoting. Um, but I, I, where's Dermot? There he is, back there. So Dermot knows I'm very proud of my Irish heritage, so I have to add a little toast in the end. Uh, may you be in heaven a half hour before the devil knows your day. Cheers! 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 Okay, got that out of the way. Okay, so, all right. I'm going to do my beverage now because I might spill it otherwise, but get comfortable. Okay. In your, you know, your chairs. And I'm just going to stand here until you get two bar stools. So, uh, that's why I'm standing. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so, so we talked a little bit earlier about how your careers had a crossover at Pfizer. So, thinking about the way the veterinary marketplace has changed, the way our industry has changed, 
how do you think the role of big pharma has changed in the world we're living in now in veterinary medicine? So, you know, Julia, why don't you start out since you're kind of still living the pharma thing a little bit and share some of your thoughts with the crowd. Thank you. Um, in terms of the big pharma, uh, what we've seen in the last 10 years, did you say, is just bigger pharma, right? A lot of mergers, you guys have lived this. Uh, I certainly have lived it in my career. I have a lot of names on my resume that don't exist anymore because they all kind of ended up at Pfizer. Chocolate yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> LaRoche, Smith Line Beach, you know, these are names from our past, right? But uh, in the last 10 years, what I think has really been exciting is um, the size of the companies and the ability to have public companies for the first time really in animal health on the pharma side. So Zoetis and Aritana and a few others went public, uh, Kindred, in 2013. And I think that has really brought a whole new level of interest in animal health. And for the first time, we're able to get capital markets money to come in and support growth and innovation in the category. And for me, that's been one of the most exciting changes for our industry. Um, and having all those bankers and research analysts following us and, and disclosing data that was heretofore, you know, private, private, secret, secret, you know, couldn't have any, uh, you know, keys to the kingdom. Uh, now we're out there talking about how big it is and what the opportunities and are. And people are literally after us, right? I mean, yeah. They're interested. Yeah. yeah, they really want to know all the details. And Mike, so your perspective is going to be different. Like we said earlier, too, you have that 300, 363 perspective having worn many hats. Right. So from the, where you sit now, the American Animal Hospital Station, what do you, what do you have to say? Well, I call it a checkered pass. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you have a checkered coat on yourself. <laughs> yes. When I left practice in 1996, that's when I sold Westridge Animal Hospital. And at that time, my main connection with pharma companies was like with the rep that came in, right? And if it was somebody that I liked, I tended to do a lot of business with them. And today, it's so much different. I mean, the, you know, like I spent the 10 years at Pfizer, and the value that we could add to a practice, and it's gotten even better since, is just amazing to me. So um, it's not just some place you buy products from, they're truly trying to help you be successful and run a successful business. Way back then, I told some people, you know, if the main value your Pfizer rep brings is a dozen donuts, <laughs> you need to call the home office. <laughs> they should be delivering a whole lot more. And it's, sure. you know, it's, yeah. just, it, it's uh, grown astronaut, uh, what am I trying to say? Exponentially. Astronomically is almost the same, but yeah, yeah, thank you. So okay, so we're gonna we're gonna venture into a little more personal territory here now. So we kind of got got them started with a, a you know a question that really didn't have much heart value to it. So <laughs> so did did you have a master plan for your career, or did all of this just happen? <laughs> Mike, you want to sure. start by answering that one because you're all yeah. you're all yeah, you're all made up now. Yeah. So you can give us a good answer. Um, my master plan was that I was going to be a practitioner. And so I worked for other people, and I'm going to mention this too, you won't believe me, but every practice I ever worked in was accredited by the American Institute. <laughs> 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 and then when they opened my own practice in Topeka, Kansas, um, that became accredited within three months of opening. So I've kind of had a connection to AHA all along. But um, my master plan was to be a practitioner. And, you know, I worked for other people. I, I saw a lot of good, I saw a lot of bad, and I thought, okay, well, I'll be able to do my own practice and it's going to be just perfect. And I thought, well, you know, the main headaches I'll have is with clients being, you know, confused or upset by something. But then I remembered that I had employees. <laughs> and so when you're calling your own shots, you know, the clients were really pretty happy, but it was the employee part of it that got to be a little bit of a headache. And so somewhere along the way, and I have to, uh, you know, point out my wife Beth here sitting right up front and um, the whole time that I was working these horrendous hours and um, we had two little kids and uh, I uh, I owe a lot to you because there's no way in how I could have done the things that I've done in my career if you weren't there to help keep things afloat at home so that's <laughs> Um, but at any rate, I, uh, 
I realized when, you know, it, it dawned on me one night when I was sitting at my kitchen table at three in the morning sending paychecks and I was working my practice. I had a part-time job with Hills where I went down and did some consulting and stuff during the day and it dawned on me that that probably wasn't a very good way to live. And then it dawned on me that I'd see 40 people in a day, there'd be 39 nice people and when you know what, and I would remember the one instead of the 39 nice people. So uh, had I not made a shift in my career at that point, I was about 10 years in, and I, I, I call it reinventing myself because I sold my practice and I went into the, uh, the pharma side of things. I worked for Heska at that point in time. And if I hadn't done that, I think that I would not be the happy, healthy guy you see sitting here in front of you. I wouldn't be pointing out my wife because she would have left many years ago. <laughs> and I would probably just be a grumpy old curmudgeon. So, um, and it's been that way about every 10 years I've kind of had the opportunity to reinvent myself and it's worked for me. So, um, I, you know, when I came to AHA, Dr. Albers, my predecessor, had been there for 23 years. I remember telling him that if I stayed there that long, they were going to have to widen the doorways to accommodate my walker, and I beat them <laughs> as I can. So, anyway, I'll shush now. Yeah. Say something That's interesting. Good, something good. <laughs> yeah. Well, something interesting. Real quick, it's like when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that the vet actually remembers you saying when you were in practice oh, yeah. that you would work for her all Sunday. Oh, she vet said in vet yeah. school one time, I said, you know, that, that head of AHA would be a really cool job. Mm -hmm. And well, since she remembers it, I'm sure it happened. <laughs> I don't remember saying it, but it's just kind of, uh, uh, you know, destiny or something, I guess. You put it out there in the universe. And right. It somewhere happens. That's so what did right. you put in the universe, Julie? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, but one thing I want to start with is Mike and I realized tonight that we were both uh, celebrating our 39th year of marriage this year. Oh, wow. Not to each other. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
the reason that I did that was because the company that had the asset were going down the wrong path. And I said, you know, if I can write a business plan for you and start a company, would you fund me? And, and the answer was yes. And that was me being an accidental entrepreneur. And since I did that, you know, I have not wanted to do anything but. And, uh, and I love helping young companies get started in this industry. And part of that you know, change over the last 10 years of big companies getting bigger is it's now started to create um, a, a fertile ground for an ecosystem of small companies. And now we see many more innovative young companies. And several of you are, are here tonight, and thank you for coming, uh, that are also planning to make a difference in their business. And that's a, really, it's a great segue to my third question. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that worked out so perfectly. So again, you, the two of you were chosen by Catherine and me because we really felt that there was, you have so much experience and input. So I'm gonna ask one final question here, and then we'll open it up to some Q&A from people. But what is one key piece of advice or one key thing you would ask? We have, we have a phenomenal gathering of current industry leaders and future leaders in the profession here in this room tonight. So what is the one thing you would say to them, start doing this tomorrow to help the profession continue to thrive? I don't have surprise. We talked about this question. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, you know, one of the things that I think would be super helpful is if we figured out how to make more segmentation in the veterinary community, such that um, kind of no matter what level you are in income, you have a place to go for veterinary care. And no matter how much you want to spend on your pet, that there's a place where you can go and get the absolute highest standard of care. And if we could figure out how to work cohesively, to me, with general practices and specialists and creating that referral system that works really well, um, fluid-like, um, between the two, um, I think it would take everybody to different levels in the veterinary profession. I, I really, I, I know the question. No, but I think, I, I think you're, you're getting to the point. It's like, so what can we all do in our respective, not to paraphrase, but in our respective roles, our respective roles to try to move that, that need, that, that, that purpose forward? Huh? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I think that's, a, for me, it's like, you have to focus on our, our on it's a veterinarian, and for me, it always will be. And really, the input and the influence that they have in the standard of care and in veterinary medicine, and, and just making sure everybody has a place to go. I mean, we, we were we were looking at the millennials as, you know, what if the millennials don't spend? Well, they ended up they are spending, you know, but they're, but they're thinking about it in a different way, and they're shopping in a different way. Yet the veterinarian's purpose is really still vital right. at all levels. So trying to figure out how that all works well together, I think would be super helpful for the profession. I totally agree. We've been having some conversations with Dr. Michael Blackwell at the University of Tennessee, and his group released a report just in December about access to veterinary care. And I think that you know, yeah. that's really going to be a, a really important thing moving forward because we're kind of in that the haves and the have-nots, and I'll, I'll be honest, and this is kind of embarrassing to me, but when I was a young uh, veterinarian, probably had a little bit of youthful arrogance in me, I remember saying to somebody that, you know, having a pet is not a God-given right. You know, if you can't pay for one, you shouldn't have one. And then I was this, you know, Topeka, Kansas kid, and I spent a lot of time in New York City when I worked for Pfizer, and I would go out, and some of you Wallace, I know you do, and Mike and I were in New York a lot at the same time, we'd go out, and we had this route we did through Midtown, and, and I would see the same homeless people, time after time after time, and many times they'd have a dog or once in a while a cat with them, and after passing them by and just kind of observing and you know, thinking and probably maturing a little bit, it dawned on me that that pet might be the one positive Thing that that person has in their entire life. So 
um, I took a step back and said, you know, who the hell am I to make that kind of a judgment on right. somebody? So I truly believe that everybody should have access to care in, in some form or fashion. But my one thing that I would share is way, way, way less grandiose, but it's something that I've observed in our profession, and that is that we can't be arrogant. Right. And I know people, I interact with people who are arrogant in our profession, and if you want to make me turn away and not ever want to talk to you or do business with you, be arrogant. <laughs> and the thing is, it doesn't matter who you are. I mean, you know, Kristen Peck is a great example. You know, she's got a fantastic job. She's got this amazing history. But if you Google arrogant, you will not see Kristen Peck's picture there, right? She is not. And the thing about it is, nobody cares. You know, we're such a small profession. And you, you take one step out of our profession, and nobody knows who you are, and they don't care who you are, right? <laughs> and that's okay. That's totally okay. And I just, I feel really strongly about that. And when you told me, you know, it's like, well, you know, we want to do this because, you know, people write your name up when we ask who they'd like to have a cup of coffee with. And I said, well, why don't they just call me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll, I'm happy to talk to anybody anytime. And that's exactly what he said. He's like, really? Why don't you just call me? Well, that's right after I said, I think Icon is like, that's what you tell old people. That's <laughs> exactly <laughs> sponsors who have helped the Bridge Club go into year two here now. So we want to be um, give our, our most gracious thanks to Zoetis. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Canaan was able to make it tonight, but they're another organization that believed in this from the very start, so we appreciate that. Animal Policy Group and, and Mark Cushing um, is also giving his great support. And then, of course, Stevens and Associates, who has given us some of And then we'll open it up for questions. I know some people have other things they have to go to, so and I want. And the gifts. Oh, and the gifts, exactly. So we have a. We have, well, let's, let's give the toast. Right. Okay, everyone grab a glass. So the thing I love the most about animal health is that we are all either one separation or two away from each other. And that to me makes this industry, as well as the veterinarian as our customer, the best industry to be part of. So we are gifting our icons with one of our phenomenally coveted Bridge Club mugs. <laughs> yes, so they're actually smaller than real life. Absolutely. So now I know I, I would welcome everybody to have another drink. Does anybody have any questions for, for Mike or Julia that you want to put out? Or did they do a thing so eloquently? Oh, ah, Carrie. Yes. So uh, this is, I'm a second generation AHA. My mother was a director. Okay. And I want to know, Mike, you've been, you've been really great about supporting innovation in the future. But what do you see? I mean, you have a broader view than a lot of us um, into a lot of different types of hospitals. What do you see with this change that's happening with connecting with what is preventive care, with what is what the pet parent wants, what do you see happening out there and what do you think is going to keep us relevant in the future? Excellent question, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, I, I have to think really, really high level here. And I think that the biggest mistake that we can make is if we forget to be good listeners. And, you know, we talk about the generational differences and all of these things. The one um, common uh, denominator to all of this is the human-animal bond. And I don't believe that it's ever been as strong as it is today, and it doesn't seem to be weakening. It just seems to be getting stronger and stronger. Um, we were having a conversation earlier. We saw a couple of dogs, you know, being put through the casino or whatever. I'm not sure what they were playing. But <laughs> <laughs> and, and she's like, Kitty oh, glitter. she's like, and the princess dog. <laughs> you know, I want to I go see our dog. You know, they're in the kennel, and, and you know, I'm, I'm 
I was talking to Marty Becker earlier today, and he was like, did you ever notice how your dogs are really tired when they come home from their kennel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, they come home and crash. And he goes, well, you know, we never paid any attention to whether our hospitalized or boarding patients as patients bothered to sleep. Webcam. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and then I said, well, you know, cats never sleep. And this lady said, well, you've never seen my cats. I said, yeah, but they've got one eye open. <laughs> no, but seriously, though, I really believe that um, if we don't lose sight of that part of it, and we continue to listen to the wants and needs of our clientele, that we're going to be a very thriving and relevant profession. If we don't do that, and if we allow um, other components of the industry to you know, sort of insert themselves between the client and the veterinarian, I think it's going to be uh, very damaging to the profession as we <laughs> Thanks to both of you for your contributions um, to the veterinary community. Um, I was really intrigued about your comments around access to care. And I just would like to maybe talk to you, ask you, what do you think about um, diversifying the profession? You know, one of the things, and I'm new to the veterinary community, but one of the things that is um, really, um, you know, really sort of resonated with me is how I think we have room to grow when it comes to diversifying the veterinary uh, community and the industry. When you talk about access to care, I think uh, diversifying the community would enable that. Wanted to hear Anna's thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I mean, you're spot on. And I don't have the, um, the magic pill to solve the diversity issue. I think the average veterinarian uh, probably can't really relate to, you know, I, I'd say the average veterinarian is probably very, at least the middle class growing up. And it's hard for them to relate to somebody who absolutely just plain can't afford it. Sure. So um, certainly anything we can do to promote uh, diversity candidates, if you will, coming into our profession, getting into veterinary school, I think absolutely has to happen. And um, the people who look like me need to quit discouraging young people <coughs> from coming into the profession. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> yeah, I have I have this thing, you know, with the white hair and everything that I'll have these brilliant thoughts and then they just like vanish. So I wrote a couple of things down here. <laughs> these are these are the things that I think you need to do. Um, let common sense prevail. Okay. I already said it. Don't be arrogant. Do what you say you'll do. Every time. Make sure you develop people. When I look back on my career, the most uh, you know, heartfelt joy and satisfaction I get is when I see somebody that I've hired somewhere along the way that has gone on to do great things. So develop people. Um, remember that leadership is not a popularity contest. Jack Welch stole that one from me. <laughs> <laughs> remember to have fun. And remember um, responsibility, and I have to explain this just a little bit. Would you stand here, and would you stand there? Oh, God, so, I'm don't, worry, you, don't ask me to fall you, over and have you Okay, you're a stimulus, right? Okay. You're a response. Okay, so say something stimulating. Catherine, your hair looks amazing tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. That's so, in this brief, I mean, microsecond between stimulus and response, I have the ability as a human being, and we're the only ones on earth that can do this, we can decide how we want to respond, right? So in this millisecond, then I say, why, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I went to someone today, and they fixed my hair. <laughs> but anyway, we have that millisecond. So remember response, response, ability. You have the ability to take that fraction of a second and figure out how to come back. So sometimes that means you don't answer that email or until you cool off. Or right? <laughs> Who's been guilty of firing one off? <laughs> right. So you did not use your responsibility in that situation. So that's really important. And then finally, I would just say, remember, you got to have fun. Yeah. Right. Woo! Woo